You're watching the Everything Network. As early as his teens, Gotti was running errands for Karma and Fatico, a capo in the Gambino family, then known as the Anastasia family under the leadership of boss Albert Anastasia. Gotti carried out truck hijackings at Idlewild Airport, now John F. Kennedy International Airport, together with his brother Gene and friend Angelo Ruggiero. During this time, Gotti befriended fellow mob hijacker and future Bonanno family boss Joseph Messino, and he was given the nicknames Black John and Crazy Horse. It was around this time that John met his mentor, Gambino underboss Agnello Neil Della Croce. In February 1968, United Airlines employees identified Gotti as the man who had signed for stolen merchandise. The FBI arrested him for that hijacking soon after. He was arrested a third time for hijacking while out on bail two months later, this time for stealing a load of cigarettes worth $50,000 on the New Jersey Turnpike. Later that year, Gotti pleaded guilty to a Northwest Airlines hijacking and was sentenced to three years at Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary. Gotti and Ruggiero were paroled in 1972 and returned to their old crew at the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club, still working under Fetico. Gotti was transferred to management of the Bergen crew's illegal gambling operation, where he proved himself to be an effective enforcer. Fatico was indicted on loan sharking charges in 1972. As a condition of his release, he could not associate with known felons. Gotti was not yet a made man due to the membership books having been closed, but Fatico named him acting capo of the Bergen crew soon after he was paroled. In this new role, Gotti frequently traveled to Della Croce's headquarters at the Ravenite Social Club to brief the underboss on the crew's activities. Della Croce had already taken a liking to Gotti, and the two became even closer during this time. The two were very similar. Both had strong violent streaks, cursed frequently and were heavy gamblers. After Manuel Gambino, nephew to boss Carlo Gambino, was kidnapped and murdered in 1973, Gotti was assigned to the hit team alongside Ruggiero and Ralph Gallioni to search for the main suspect, gangster James McBratney. The team botched their attempt to abduct McBratney at a Staten Island bar when they attempted to arrest him while posing as detectives, and Gallioni shot McBratney dead when his accomplices managed to restrain him. Gotti was identified by eyewitnesses and by a police insider, and was arrested for the killing in June 1974. He was able to strike a plea bargain, however, with the help of attorney Roy Cohn, and was sentenced to four years imprisonment for attempted manslaughter for his part in the hit. Following Gotti's death, he was also identified by Messino as the killer of Vito Borelli, a Gambino associate murdered in 1975. Remo Franceschini, a member of the New York City Police Department from 1957 to 1991, who specialized in organized crime, when asked in 1993 why he knew at an early stage that Gotti would become a major figure in the Mafia said, He was charismatic and a leader. He wasn't a womanizer. He spent all his time with his men. He also had a very sharp mind and total recall. And he exuded toughness. There were few men who would go against him. On October 15, 1976, Carlo Gambino died at his home of natural causes. Against expectations, he had appointed Paul Castellano to succeed him over his underboss Neil Della Croce. Gambino appeared to believe that his crime family would benefit from Castellano's focus on white-collar businesses. Neil, at the time, was imprisoned for tax evasion and was unable to contest Castellano's succession. Castellano's succession was confirmed at a meeting on November 24 with Della Croce present. Castellano arranged for Neil to remain as underboss while directly running the family's affairs. While Della Croce accepted Castellano's succession, the deal effectively split the Gambino family into two rival factions. In 1976, the Gambino family's membership books were reportedly reopened. Gotti was released in July 1977. After two years imprisonment, he was subsequently initiated into the crime family, now under the command of Castellano, and immediately promoted to replace Fatico as capo of the Bergen crew. Gotti's crew reported directly to Della Croce as part of the concessions given by Castellano to keep Neil Della Croce's underboss, and Gotti was regarded as Della Croce's protege. 
Under Gotti, the crew were Delacroix's biggest earners. Besides his cut of his subordinates' earnings, Gotti ran his own loan sharking operation and held a no-show job as a plumbing supply salesman. Unconfirmed allegations by FBI informants claim that Gotti also financed drug deals. In December 1978, Gotti assisted in the largest unrecovered cash robbery in history, the infamous Lufthansa heist at Kennedy Airport. Gotti had made arrangements for the getaway van to be crushed and bailed at a scrapyard in Brooklyn. However, the driver of the van, Parnell Stax Edwards, failed to follow orders. Rather than driving the vehicle to the scrapyard, he parked it near a fire hydrant and went to sleep at his girlfriend's apartment. Gotti mostly tried to distance his personal family from his life of crime, with the exception of his son John Jr., who was a mob associate by 1982. However, on March 18, 1980, Gotti's youngest son, 12-year-old Frank, was run over and killed on a family friend's minibike by a neighbor named John Favara. Frank's death was ruled an accident, but Favara subsequently received death threats and was attacked by Gotti's wife with a baseball bat when he visited their home to apologize. Months later, Favara was abducted and disappeared, presumed murdered. Gotti is widely assumed to have ordered the murder despite him and his family leaving on vacation for Florida three days prior. Gotti was indicted on two occasions in his last two years as the Bergen Capo, with both cases coming to trial after his ascension to boss of the Gambino family. In September 1984, he had an altercation with a refrigerator mechanic named Romuald Pischik and was subsequently charged with assault and robbery. In 1985, he was indicted alongside Della Crochet and several Bergen crew members in a racketeering case by assistant attorney Diane Giacoloni. The indictment revealed that Gotti's friend and co-defendant, Wilfred Willie Boy Johnson, had been an FBI informant. John quickly became dissatisfied with Castellano's leadership of the Gambino family, regarding the new boss as being too isolated and greedy. Like other members of the family, Gotti also personally disliked Castellano. The boss lacked street credibility, and those who had paid their dues running street-level jobs did not respect him. Gotti had an economic interest as well. He had a running dispute with Castellano on the split Gotti took from truck hijackings at Kennedy Airport. John was also rumored to be expanding into drug dealing, a lucrative trade Castellano had banned. In August 1983, Ruggiero and Jean Gotti were arrested for dealing heroin, based primarily on recordings from a bug in Ruggiero's house. Castellano, who had banned, made men from his family from dealing drugs under threat of death, demanded transcripts of the tapes, and when Ruggiero refused, he threatened to demote Gotti. In 1984, Castellano was arrested and indicted in a RICO case for the crimes of Gambino hitman Roy DeMeo's crew. The following year, he received a second indictment for his role in the commission, the Mafia's governing body. Facing life imprisonment for either case, Castellano arranged for Gotti to serve as an acting boss alongside Thomas Bellotti, Castellano's favorite captain, and Thomas Gambino in his absence. Gotti, meanwhile, began conspiring with fellow disgruntled Captain Frank DeChico and Joseph Joe Piney Armon and soldiers Sammy the Bull Gravano and Robert DiBernardo collectively dubbed the fist. Armon's support was critical. As a respected old-timer who dated back to the family's founder, Vincent Mangano, he would lend the credibility to the conspirators' cause. It had long been a rule in the Mafia that a boss could only be killed with the approval of a majority of the commission. Indeed, Gotti's planned hit would have been the first unsanctioned hit on a boss of the five families since Frank Costello was nearly killed in 1957 and would have been the first on any boss since Angelo Bruno in 1980. Gotti knew that it would be too risky to solicit support from the other four bosses since they had long-standing ties to Castellano. To get around this, he got the support of several important figures of his generation in the Lucchese, Colombo and Bonanno families. He did not consider approaching the Genovese family Castellano's ties with Genovese boss Vincent the Chin Gigante were so close that any overture to a Genovese soldier would have been a tip-off. However, Gotti could also count on the complicity of Gambino consigliere Joseph Ingallo. After Delacroce died of cancer on December 2, 1985, Castellano revised his succession plan, 
appointing Bellotti as underboss to Thomas Gambino as the sole acting boss, while making plans to break up Gotti's crew. Infuriated by this, and by Castellano's refusal to attend Della Croce's wake, Gotti resolved to kill his boss. When De Chico tipped off Gotti that he would be having a meeting with Castellano and several other Gambino mobsters at Sparks Steakhouse on December 16th, Gotti chose to take the opportunity. Both the boss and underboss were ambushed and shot dead by assassins under Gotti's command when they arrived at the meeting in the evening. Gotti watched the hit from his car alongside Gravano. Several days after the murder, Gotti was named to a three-man committee to temporarily run the Gambino family, pending the election of a new boss, along with Gallo and De Chico. It was also announced that an internal investigation into Castellano's murder was underway. However, it was an open secret that Gotti was acting boss in all but name, and nearly all of the family's captains knew he had been the one behind the hit. He was formally acclaimed as the new boss of the family at a meeting of 20 captains, held on January 15, 1986. He appointed Frank De Chico as the new underboss, while retaining Gallo as consigliere. Identified as both Castellano's likely murderer and his successor, Gotti rose to fame throughout 1986. At the time of his takeover, the Gambino family was regarded as the most powerful American Mafia family, with an annual income of $500 million. In the book Underboss, Gravano estimated that Gotti himself had an annual income of no less than $5 million during his years as boss, and more likely between $10 million and $12 million. To protect himself legally, Gotti banned members of the family from accepting plea bargains that acknowledged the existence of the organization. Gotti often smiled and waved at television cameras at his trials, which gained him favor with some of the general public. His newfound notoriety had at least one positive effect upon the revelation of his attacker's occupation and amid reports of intimidation by the Gambinos. Pichik decided not to testify against Gotti, thanks to Bosco the Yugo Radonjic, the head of the Westies in Hell's Kitchen. When the trial began in March 1986, Pichik testified he was unable to remember who attacked him. The case was promptly dismissed, with the New York Post summarizing the proceedings with the headline, I Forgotti. It was later revealed that Gambino mobsters had severed Pichik's brake lines, made threatening phone calls and stalked him before the trial. On April 13, 1986, De Chico was killed in a car bombing following a visit to Castellano loyalist James Fila. The bombing was carried out by Victor Amuso and Anthony Casso of the Lucchese family, under orders of Gigante and Lucchese boss Anthony Corallo. To avenge Castellano and Bellotti by killing their successors, Gotti also planned to visit Fila that day but cancelled and the bomb was detonated after a soldier who rode with De Chico was mistaken for the boss. Bombs had long been banned by the Mafia out of concern that it would put innocent people in harm's way, leading the Gambinos to initially suspect that Zips, Sicilian mafiosi working in the U.S., were behind it. Zips were well known for using bombs. Following the bombing, Judge Eugene Nickerson, presiding over Gotti's racketeering trial, rescheduled to avoid a jury tainted by the resulting publicity. While Giacalone had Gotti's bail revoked due to evidence of witness intimidation in the Pisha case. From jail, Gotti ordered the murder of Di Bernardo by Gravano. Both Di Bernardo and Ruggiero had been vying to succeed De Chico until Ruggiero accused Di Bernardo of challenging Gotti's leadership. When Ruggiero, also under indictment, had his bail revoked for his abrasive behavior in preliminary hearings, a frustrated Gotti instead promoted Armand to underboss. Jury selection for the racketeering case began again in August 1986, with Gotti standing trial alongside his ex-companion Johnson, who despite being exposed as an informant, refused to turn state's evidence. Leonard DiMaria, Tony Rampino, Nicholas Carozzo, and John Carneglia. At this point, the Gambino family were able to compromise the case when George Pape hid his friendship with Radonjic and was impaneled as juror number 11 through Radonjic. Pape contacted Gravano and agreed to sell his vote on the jury for $60,000. In the trial's opening statements on September 25th, Gotti's defense attorney Bruce Cutler 
denied the existence of the Gambino family, and framed the government's entire effort as a personal vendetta. His main defense strategy during the prosecution was to attack the credibility of Giacalone's witnesses by discussing their crimes committed before their turning state's evidence. During Gotti's defense, Cutler called bank robber Matthew Trainer, a would-be prosecution witness dropped for unreliability, who testified that Giacalone offered him drugs and her underwear as a masturbation aid in exchange for his testimony. Trainer's allegations would be dismissed by Judge Nickerson as wholly unbelievable after the trial, and he was subsequently convicted of perjury. Despite Cutler's defense and critiques about the prosecution's performance, according to mob writers Jerry Capecci and Gene Mustaine, when the jury's deliberations began, a majority were in favor of convicting Gotti. However, due to Pape's misconduct, Gotti knew from the beginning of the trial that he could do no worse than a hung jury. During deliberations, Pape held out for acquittal until the rest of the jury began to fear their own safety would be compromised. On March 13, 1987, they acquitted Gotti and his co-defendants of all charges, including loan sharking, illegal gambling, murder, and truck hijackings. Five years later, Pape was convicted of obstruction of justice for his part in the fix and sentenced to three years in prison. In the face of previous Mafia convictions, particularly the success of the Mafia Commission trial, Gotti's acquittal was a major upset that further added to his reputation. The American media dubbed him the Teflon Don in reference to the failure of any charges to stick. While Gotti himself had escaped conviction, his associates were not as fortunate. The other two men in the Gambino administration, underboss Joe Piney Armone and consigliere Joseph Ngallo, had been indicted on racketeering charges in 1986 and were both convicted in December 1987. Ruggiero and Gene Gotti's heroin trial also commenced in June of that year. Prior to their convictions, Gotti demoted Gallo, who retired to allow Gravano to take his place, while slating Frank Locascio to serve as acting underboss in the event of Joe Armone's imprisonment. The Gambinos also worked to compromise the heroin trial's jury, resulting in two mistrials. When the terminally ill Ruggiero was severed and released in 1989, Gotti refused to contact him, blaming him for the Gambino family's misfortunes. According to Gravano, Gotti also considered murdering Ruggiero, and when he finally died, I literally had to drag him to the funeral. Beginning in January 1988, Gotti, against Gravano's advice, required his capos to meet with him at the Revenite Social Club once a week. Regarded by Gene as an unnecessary vanity-inspired risk, and by FBI Gambino squad leader Bruce Moe as antithetical to the secret society. This move allowed FBI surveillance to record and identify much of the Gambino hierarchy. It also provided strong circumstantial evidence that Gotti was a boss. Long-standing protocol in the Mafia requires public demonstrations of loyalty to the boss. The FBI also bugged the Ravenite, but failed to produce any high-quality incriminating recordings. Later in 1988, Gotti, Gigante, and new Lucchese boss Amuso attended the first commission meeting since the commission trial, located at the Labar Bat Club in Manhattan. Two years earlier, Casso had been injured in an unauthorized hit by Gambino capo Mickey Paradiso. In 1987, the FBI warned Gotti they had recorded Genovese consigliere Louis Mana discussing another hit on Gotti and his brother. In order to avoid a war, the leaders of the three families met, denied knowledge of their violence against one another, and agreed to communicate better. The bosses also agreed to allow Colombo acting boss Victor Orena to join the commission. But Gigante, wary of giving Gotti a majority by admitting another ally, blocked the re-entry of Messino and the Bananos. Gotti was also able to influence the New Jersey-based Di Cavalcanti crime family in 1988. According to the Di Cavalcanti captain-turned-informant, Anthony Rotondo, Gotti attended his father's wake with numerous other Gambino mobsters in a show of force, and forced boss Giovanni Ridi to agree to run his family on the Gambinos' behalf. The De Cavalcantes remained in the Gambino family's sphere of influence until Gotti's imprisonment. Gotti's son, John Jr., was initiated into the Gambino family on Christmas Eve 1988. According to fellow mobster Michael DeLeonardo, initiated on the same night, 
Gravano held the ceremony to keep Gotti from being accused of nepotism. John Jr. was promptly promoted to captain. On the evening of January 23, 1989, Gotti was arrested outside the Ravenite and charged with ordering the assault of labor union official John O'Connor. In the back of the police car, he remarked, Three to one, I beat this charge. O'Connor, a leader in the United Brotherhood of Carpenters and Joiners of America, Local 608, who was later convicted of racketeering himself, was believed to have ordered an attack on a Gambino-associated restaurant that had snubbed the Union and was subsequently shot and wounded by the Westies. After one night in jail, Gotti was released on $100,000 bail. He had his occupation listed as a salesman for a plumbing contracting company. By this time, the FBI had cultivated new informants and learned part of the reason the Ravenite bug failed was because Gotti would hold sensitive conversations elsewhere, either in a rear hallway in the building the club occupied, or in an apartment in its upper floors where a friendly widow of a Gambino soldier lived. By November 1989, both locations were bugged. The apartment bug was particularly fruitful due to Gotti's frankness as he discussed his position as boss in meetings there. In a December 12 conversation with Locasio, Gotti plainly acknowledged ordering the murders of Di Bernardo and Liborio Milito, the latter being one of Gravano's partners killed for insubordination. He also announced his intent to kill soldier Louis Di Bono, who had ignored his summons to meet with John to discuss his mismanagement of a drywall business he held with Gotti and Gravano. The FBI, however, misheard the name drop and failed to warn Di Bono who was killed on October 4, 1990. In another taped meeting on January 4, 1990, Gotti promoted Gravano to underboss, preferring him to lead the family if he was convicted in the assault case. State prosecutors linked John to the case with a recording of him discussing O'Connor and announcing his intention to bust him up, and the testimony of Westie's gangster James McElroy. However, he was acquitted of all six assault and conspiracy charges at trial on February 9, 1990. After the trial, there were firework displays by locals. Jules J. Bonavolanta, director of the FBI's Organized Crime Division in New York, stated, With all this media coverage, he's beginning to look like a folk hero. What the public should realize is that he is the boss of the largest Cosa Nostra family, that he surrounds himself with ruthless killers, and that he is flat out a criminal. It later emerged that FBI bugs had apparently caught Gotti discussing plans to fix the jury as he had in the 1986 racketeering case. To the outrage of Manhattan District Attorney Robert Morgenthau and State Organized Crime Task Force Chief Ronald Goldstock, the FBI and federal prosecutors chose not to reveal this information to them. Morgenthau later said that had he known about these bugged conversations, he would have asked for a mistrial. Gotti, Gravano, and Locasio were often recorded by the bugs placed throughout the Ravenite, concealed in the main room, the first floor hallway in the upstairs apartment discussing incriminating events. On December 11, 1990, FBI agents and NYPD detectives raided the Ravenite, arresting Gotti, Gravano, and Locasio. Federal prosecutors charged Gotti, in this new racketeering case, with five murders Castellano, Bellotti di Bernardo Melito and, after review of the apartment tapes, Louis de Bono. Conspiracy to murder Gaetano Corky Vastola. Loan sharking, illegal gambling, obstruction of justice, bribery, and tax evasion. Based on tapes from FBI bugs played at pretrial hearings, the Gambino administration was denied bail. At the same time, attorneys Cutler and Gerald Shargo were disqualified from defending Gotti and Gravano after prosecutors successfully contended they were part of the evidence and thus liable to be called as witnesses. Prosecutors argued that Cutler and Shargo not only knew about potential criminal activity, but had worked as in-house counsel for the Gambino family. Gotti subsequently hired Albert Krieger, a Miami attorney who had worked with Joseph Bonanno, to replace Cutler. The tapes also created a rift between Gotti and Gravano, where the Gambino boss described his newly appointed underboss as too greedy and attempted to frame Gravano as the main force behind the murders of De Bernardo, Milito, and Di Bono. Gotti's attempt at reconciliation failed, leaving Gravano disillusioned with the mob and doubtful on his chances of winning his case without Shargol, his former attorney. 
Gravano ultimately opted to turn state's evidence, formally agreeing to testify on November 13, 1991. He was the highest ranking member of a New York crime family to turn informer until Joseph Massino in 2003. Gotti and Locascio were tried in the United States District Court for the Eastern District of New York before District Judge Leo Glasser. Jury selection began in January 1992 with an anonymous jury and, for the first time in a Brooklyn federal case, fully sequestered during the trial due to Gotti's reputation for jury tampering. The trial commenced with the prosecution's opening statements on February 12th. Prosecutors Andrew Maloney and John Gleason began their case by playing tapes showing Gotti discussing Gambino family business, including murders he approved, and confirming the animosity between Gotti and Castellano to establish the former's motive to kill his boss. After calling an eyewitness of the Castellano hit who identified Carneglia as one of the men who shot Bellotti, they then brought Gravano to testify on March 2nd. On the stand, Gravano confirmed Gotti's place in the structure of the Gambino family and described in detail the conspiracy to assassinate Castellano, giving a full description of the hit and its aftermath. Gravano confessed to 19 murders, implicating Gotti in four of them. Krieger and Locascio's attorney Anthony Cardinale proved unable to shake Gravano during cross-examination. After additional testimony and tapes, the government rested its case on March 24th. Five of Krieger and Cardinale's intended six witnesses were ruled irrelevant or extraneous, leaving only Gotti's tax attorney Murray Appleman to testify on his behalf. The defense also attempted unsuccessfully to have a mistrial declared based on Maloney's closing remarks. Gotti himself became increasingly hostile during the trial, and at one point, Glasser threatened to remove him from the courtroom. Among other outbursts, Gotti called Gravano a junkie while his attorneys sought to discuss his past steroid use and equated the dismissal of a juror to the fixing of the 1919 World Series. On April 2, 1992, after only 14 hours of deliberation, the jury found Gotti guilty on all charges of the indictment. Locascio was found guilty on all but one. James Fox, assistant director in charge of the FBI's New York field office, announced at a press conference, the Teflon is gone, the Don is covered with Velcro, and all the charges stuck. On June 23, 1992, Glasser sentenced both defendants to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole and a $250,000 fine. Remembering how his father had been brought down by FBI bugs, Gotti Jr. adopted a more secretive way of doing business. He discussed mob business mainly through walk talks, or conversations held while walking alongside trusted captains. He also tried to pose as a legitimate businessman. However, several of his button men didn't think much of him, thinking he was incompetent. He was not nearly as good a negotiator as his father had been, and the Gambinos lost out on several disputes with the other families. The Genovese family was so unimpressed with Gotti that it refused to deal with him at all. In 1995, Charles Carneglia and John A. Light were involved in a major conspiracy to murder Gotti. In a 1997 search of the basement of a property owned by Junior, the FBI found a typed list of the names of the maid members of his organization, as well as $348,700 in cash, a list of the guests who attended his wedding along with the dollar amount of their wedding gifts, totaling more than $350,000, and two handguns. Also found was a list of several men who were inducted into other families in 1991 and 1992. A long-standing rule in the New York Mafia calls for prospective members to be vetted by the other families before being inducted. However, normally these lists are destroyed almost as soon as the inductions take place. The discovery enraged Gotti Sr. as well as the other bosses, since it put dozens of other mafiosi at risk of government scrutiny. By 1998, when he was indicted on racketeering charges under the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act, Gotti Jr. was believed to be the acting boss of the family. Many of the charges related to attempts to extort money from the owners and employees of Scores, an upscale strip club in Manhattan. According to the indictment, 
The Gambinos had forced the owners of scores to pay $1 million over a six-year period in order to stay in business, with Gotti's share of the money totaling $100,000. In addition to the lists seized in the 1997 raid, prosecutors obtained transcripts of prison conversations, in which the Gambino boss received advice from his father on how to run the family. On April 5, 1999, faced with overwhelming evidence, he pleaded guilty to four acts of racketeering, including bribery, extortion, and the threat of violence, against his father's advice. His lawyer said he decided to accept a plea bargain because he believed that he would be subjected to repeated prosecutions in multiple jurisdictions if he did not. On September 4, 1999, Gotti Jr. was sentenced to six years and five months in prison and fined $1 million. Federal prosecutors said his uncle, Peter Gotti, became head of the Gambino organization after Jr. was sent to prison, and he is believed to have formally succeeded his brother shortly before Gotti Sr.'s death in June 2002. Jr.'s indictment had brought stress on his parents' marriage, his mother, up to that point, unaware of her son's involvement in the mafia, blamed her husband for ruining her son's life and threatened to leave him unless he allowed him to leave the mob. In 2004, months before he was released from prison, Gotti was charged in an 11-count racketeering indictment, which included an alleged plot to kidnap Curtis Sliwa, founder of the Guardian Angels, as well as securities fraud, extortion, and loan sharking. A radio talk show host, Sliwa had allegedly angered the family by denouncing the elder Gotti as public enemy on his show. During the trial, two former associates, Michael DiLeonardo and Joseph D'Angelo, testified against Gotti. Through his attorney Jeffrey Lichtman, Gotti admitted that he had been involved in the Gambino crime family in the 1990s and had even been slated to lead the organization after his father was sent to jail in 1992, but claimed he had left criminal life behind after his conviction in 1999. Three juries eventually deadlocked on the charges, the last in 2006, and federal prosecutors decided not to pursue a fourth trial. In August 2008, Jr. was arrested and indicted on racketeering and murder conspiracy charges brought in Florida. The charges stemmed from an alleged drug trafficking ring Gotti operated along with former associate turned government witness, John A. Light, and with the murders of George Grosso in 1988, Louis de Bono in 1990, and Bruce John Goderup in 1991. Prosecutors charged that the ring distributed at least five kilograms of cocaine in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Gotti's trial was later moved to New York, where he pleaded not guilty, and began in September 2009. In January 2008, A-Light pleaded guilty to two murders, four murder conspiracies, at least eight shootings, and two attempted shootings, as well as armed home invasions and armed robberies in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Florida, stemming from his alleged involvement in a Gambino crew in Tampa, Florida. A. Light agreed to testify in the trial of Gambino family enforcer Charles Carneglia, who was found guilty of four murders and is now serving a life sentence. He then served as a key prosecution witness against Gotti. During the trial, Gotti allegedly threatened A. Light by mouthing the words, I'll kill you, and engaged in a shouting match with his former associate. After the incident, Victoria Gotti told the New York Daily News that A. Light was a pathological liar, a rat caught in a proverbial trap, caught in his own lies. A. Light testified that Gotti was responsible for at least eight murders, among other crimes. On December 1, 2009, the 12 jurors announced that they had failed to reach a unanimous verdict on all the charges, and the judge declared a mistrial. After the trial, jurors said that they did not find witnesses, particularly A. Light, to be credible, one of the jurors said they should stop this now, it's ridiculous, while another said it's abusive, it's almost become a mockery. Gotti Jr. was released on December 1st, 2009. After Gotti's fourth mistrial, federal prosecutors had indicated that they would not seek another trial against Gotti. In January 2010, the government decided not to pursue further charges against Gotti. Gotti Jr. maintains that he has since left the Gambino family. And in a 2015 interview with the New York Daily News, Gotti denied claims that he was an informant, claiming that he did give the FBI information but that it was false information and that no indictments resulted from the information he gave agents. In 
In June 2002, a few days before his brother John's death, Peter Gotti was indicted on federal racketeering charges. During Gotti's trial, federal prosecutors released information revealing that Gotti was having an affair with Marjorie Alexander, a longtime girlfriend. Alexander then publicly acknowledged the liaison and declared her love for Gotti. In response, Gotti berated Alexander for causing the publicity and broke off all contact with her. Alexander later committed suicide in 2004. During this time, Gotti's wife Catherine filed for divorce, which was finalized in 2006. He was convicted of extortion, money laundering and racketeering activities in March of 2004, centered on the Brooklyn and Staten Island waterfronts, and for the attempted extortion of film actor Steven Seagal. On April 15, 2004, Judge Frederick Block of the United States District Court for the Eastern District of New York sentenced Gotti to nine years and four months in prison for the charges. During the trial, Gotti's lawyers stated that he was blind in one eye and suffered from thyroid goiter, sciatica, emphysema, rheumatoid arthritis, post-concussion syndrome, and depression. On December 22, 2004, Peter was convicted in a separate trial of racketeering charges related to extortion in the construction industry and conspiring to murder government informant and former Gambino underboss Sammy Gravano. On July 27, 2005, Judge Richard C. Casey sentenced Gotti to 25 years in prison for the charges. He was imprisoned at the Federal Correctional Complex, Butner. His projected release date was September 10, 2031. During the early and mid-2000s, Peter Gotti held on to power through old family loyalists who ran the family while he was imprisoned. These loyalists included Arnold Zeke Squidieri and John D'Amico. However, after multiple indictments and weakening of the Gotti faction by law enforcement efforts, that by the late 2000s following D'Amico's imprisonment, that the Sicilian faction took de facto control of the family and that Gotti was kept in his place as boss in name only. However, in July 2011, Domenico Cefalu reportedly replaced Gotti as Gambino boss ending his reign as boss and virtually his career as a mobster since he wouldn't be released before passing away in 2021. You're watching the Everything Network. Please don't forget to subscribe to the channel, hit the like button and also the notification bell.